Welcome, fellow brave believers. This is Kingdom in Context, and I'm your host, Sean. I want to thank you for joining me tonight. We're going to begin our 42 series, and uh, I'm excited, and I hope that you are too. I want to thank everyone that's in the live chat already. Looks like we got over 100 people in the live chat. That's awesome. Um, Discipleship Dialogues. Welcome back, brother. Miriam New, B Water 89, Nicholas, Arden A, Controversial of Elohe, A and R Generation, Donna Porter, Miss Marsha, Stan, Tracy Jones, Jacqueline Green, Melissa, William Simpson. Beetlejuice is back. Alan and Sharon Pisarek. Brad Dills here. Tyler Porter. Welcome, everyone. And so many other familiar names. Um, as you just saw the, the announcement, we are um, <clears throat> we do have the Kingdom in Context app ready for you to download. It's free, Apple Store or Google Play Store. And uh, it's, it's ready. It's free to download. That way you can always be notified of when we go live, when we drop new videos or content. And uh, we're even doing a giveaway in our um, it's a 60 by 80 queen size fleece blanket that we're giving away. It's got the Kingdom of Context logo on it. And you have eight different colors to choose from. So two weeks from now, November 17th, during um, the next installment of this series, we're going to be announcing the winner of that. Now, the easiest way to enter that drawing for that giveaway for that fleece blanket, if you'd like it, is just to open the app, go to the homepage, and then enter your email. That's not the homepage. And then enter your email. There it is. That's still not it getting all kinds of notifications on my phone. Um, enter your email right there in the little spot right below the videos. And that way um, you can be a part of the drawing. You can check to see if you enter the correct email in the settings icon underneath email notifications. So I wanna thank everyone for being here. And uh, we've got some fun stuff to cover tonight. This is our 42 series. You guys ready? I say we get started. the beast saying who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months
Okay, we're off mute now. So Revelation 13, 4 and 5. It says, they worship the dragon who had given authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like the beast and who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to speak arrogant and blasphemous words and authority to act for 42 months. This is the time qualifier. We did our Investigating Babylon series last year, and it was 21 parts as well. This is going to be a countdown. So we're starting at part 21. We'll go down to part one. But the whole thing is centered around the 42 months leading up to the um, to the return of Yeshua of Nazareth, who is the Son of God, the Messiah. This is the one whom to whom we put our faith. We look forward to our salvation. He's the one that's going to have the, the authority given to him by the Father to raise us from the dead and give us eternal life. He's also going to come back with the kingdom and establish peace on the earth. But 42 months before he does that, some things break out. And this is the dragon whom the people worship. He has the authority to hand some authority to the beast. And then the peace, people will also worship the beast. This beast will then have that authority to act for 42 months. So we want to jump into why would the world do that? As we've talked about in the Investigating Babylon series, which is the predecessor to this series, the world and the kings of the earth have already been worshiping the, the dragon since forever, since the days of the Tower of Babel. They called him Jupiter or Zeus at the Tower of Babel. After the Tower of Babel, they stepped away speaking different languages. Different languages would call him by different things. So the Greek language came about after that as well. That's where we get the first recognized idea of Zeus being worshipped at the Tower. That's They had priests of Zeus at the Tower of Babel. But from the Hebrew, we understood that he was originally, by the book of Enoch, by the prophet Enoch, he was called Azazel. And he was one of the rebellious angels whom did not get locked up. He was sentenced, but his sentence doesn't start until the actual consummation of the ages. So that's why he still, quote unquote, roams around seeking who he may devour. He is still out on the earth and he is still here after the flood when the Tower of Babel is happening, leading mankind astray. And he has unclean spirits under his authority to help him do that. Over time, he recruited men by deception. They began to build the tower for approximately 42 to 43 years in order that they may ascend into the heaven and remove the authority of the Almighty so they could govern themselves. So we have this amazing backdrop for this idea, this historical precedent that all the nations and the rulers of those nations passed that idea down throughout time, throughout the generations of whom they really serve. Now, over time, once Yeshua stepped on the scene, things changed a little bit. And for the past approximately 1700 to 1800 years, they pushed those practices in the in most modern Western worlds. They pushed the majority of those out overt practices underground. But the kings of the earth, the small club that George Carlin talked about, the one that we're not in, thank, thank the father I'm not in it, they still reverence the Zeus character, whom the Egyptians called Ra, whom the was considered the dragon. They still worship him. They still revere him. And they believe the narrative that the Bible shares with us. I don't know how they describe it to them and amongst their own circles behind the scenes, but they absolutely believe that narrative. And the Bible actually tells us how this narrative is going to play out leading up to the revealing of Apollyon, which begins the 42 months. So how is the world, which already worships him secretly, going to bring an open worship and get all the peoples of the nations to fall in line with that idea? We tried to put forward in our Investigating Babylon series that they do this through mass deception over hundreds of years, leading with a biological deception into a cosmological deception. So now they've promoted this idea inside the framework of a heliocentric model. They promoted this evolutionary idea of panspermia, where the supposed belief now morphs into Earth life on Earth was seeded by an alien progenitor who must have left, now and he must be coming back at some point. So we're going to dig into how they're going to play upon that narrative 
to further get the world to accept him when he actually reveals himself that he's actually never left, but they portray him to has quote unquote, come back. The great traveler has now come back and he's here to help us. So let's see how the world is already prepping the masses and the minds of the people to be ready to reintroduce Zeus, also called Ra, also called Brahma, to the ancient Indians, to the nations. And let's look at real quick at something that happened last year while everyone was dealing with COVID. The world was doing other things. Put this on screen for us. So you guys see the boat of Ra? Remember we talked about in part four of our Investigating Babylon series, we talked about the boat of Ra, which was one of the flying Vimanas of the ancient world, whom supposedly helped Ra traverse the sky. And they're using this in this ceremony. So this is a, this is a crazy ceremony. Just in case you're just in case you're not aware of the symbolism here, this top down bird's eye view of the boats of Ra being brought through in the dark canal with the points of light. It's because the boat of Ra flew through the sky where from the ground up, you would see it flying through with the stars, see it flying through the dark sky with the points of light of the stars in and all around it. So this is just a reversed view, basically that they're, they're trying to show you of what the boat of Rob may have looked like. Now, just in case you're you're wondering about this sound, um, as far as the music, I did clip this. This was like a 30 minutes opening ceremony, and I've clipped it down to three or four minutes. 
And um, so that's why the, the soundtrack doesn't always sound the same. And there's like jumping points. But yeah, there's just a ton of symbolism everywhere in this. Um, as you can see here, they are walking on water with the moon in the background. They obviously worship the moon god um, as well as all types of other gods. But uh, the moon god was one of their major major deities that they look to and worshiped and you've got the people flying in and out. So I always thought it was interesting that several years ago, I found that the Egyptian hieroglyph for the word impossible was two feet walking on water. And I, I just love it that Luke 137 explains that uh, nothing is impossible with God. You know, and we see the son of God walking on water and helping Peter to do the same. So it's very fascinating. Okay, do you guys see this this top down view? This is right in front of the Luxor Temple, and um, they've got this golden sphere that they're walking through, and they th they've already brought the boats of Ra through the sphere to go into the temple. Just in case you guys see the symbolism of what we discussed and concluded from our Investigating Babylon series about what the sphere, the Eye of Ra, actually is. So, and of course you can see with the, with the sphere behind him in this one, there's an actual, it looks like a huge sun, basically. Uh, it's like the huge ball of light that they got on top of one of the, one of the boats. Yeah. The symbolism is absolutely everywhere. So why aren't churches doing a huge parade like that to Yeshua? I sure wish they would do that for our Lord and Savior, the actually righteous, awesome king of Yeshua. So that was a ceremony they had last year. The Egyptian government decided that they wanted to reopen uh, for ex extensive tourism and different, I guess, more access in different ways uh, to some of the ancient structures from ancient Egypt. And then they put on a full-on parade to Ra. It's it's right in our face, uh, it truly is. And so tonight, what we're going to be talking about, the, the title of this episode, this particular installment is called Breakaway Civilization. And so the Breakaway Civilization concept, it's a description of a particularly wealthy and powerful subset of the human race who have been secretly amassing for themselves exotic and highly advanced technology. This hoarding of high tech for themselves and by keeping it from the rest of the world allows these highly placed elites to actually live secret, hidden lives of extreme opulence and leisure. It's speculated that these elites have built separate cities for themselves, located either in remote places, such as underground or on the ocean floor, or within the mountains of the Antarctic or Antarctica. Now, I don't personally believe they're at the bottom of the ocean floor myself, but I definitely could see them being in remote parts of the earth, having under, we know they have underground bases, um, for several different nations have amassed what they call deep underground military bases. And they, they're they more than just military structures. There's barracks, there's shopping malls, there's uh, underground uh, food gardens that are being grown. So the idea of a breakaway civilization, 
is that number one, elites live separate and use the rest of the population for their wealth. And number two, everyone else works more than is needed for survival and enjoyment of life as the bulk of their efforts are converted and funneled into wealth and resources for the elites. Does this sound familiar? This is what the whole world has grown up kind of knowing is that, and then the more you get into, you know, the finance and politics and, and looking at where things go and why things don't make sense. And why are we sending, you know, billions of dollars over here for this? And where'd the money go? Where's the results of the product and, and the effort and what's, what's happening here? You start to realize that the majority of, of international politics are just massive money laundering schemes. The same thing for the space programs. So where is all the effort money going? All the private contractors that sign, you know, NDAs that would never tell us upon possibly losing their career, maybe even their life. Uh, they'll never tell us what they have built for these folks or if these folks are part of them. They just brought some some uh, really competent construction crews into the fold with them um, and help them get wealthy as well. <clears throat> Halliburton. So anyway, the point is you've got massive amounts of wealth that the world funnels through very ineffective and transparently dishonest taxation over most of the nations. Where's all the money going? What's happening? We, You start to hear of these secret things that are happening, being built. We're going to talk about some of those tonight. So I hope you're ready. So let's look at something real quick. As we look at what the, what the people that are at the tops of these nations, controlling the taxation, controlling the flows of international monies, what do they have planned for the future? What do they really want for us on this earth? And uh, we're going to look at that right now. Well, why, why do you think that is? I mean, why is that? I mean, is it just because people are, are lazy today or they're bored? But has it ever occurred to you, Wally, that the process that creates this boredom that we see in the world now may very well be a self-perpetuating, unconscious form of brainwashing created by a world totalitarian government based on money, and that all of this is much more dangerous than one thinks, but that somebody who's bored is asleep, and somebody who's asleep will not say no? And he told me that he no longer watches television, he doesn't read newspapers, and he doesn't read magazines, because he really does feel that we're living in some kind of Orwellian nightmare now. And that everything that you hear now contributes to turning you into a robot. Where are you from? And I said, New York. He said, ah, New York, yes, that's a very interesting place. Do you know a lot of New Yorkers who keep talking about the fact that they want to leave but never do? And I said, oh, yes. And he said, why do you think they don't leave? I gave him different banal theories. He said, oh, I don't think it's that way at all. He said, I think that New York is the new model for the new concentration camp, where the camp has been built by the inmates themselves, and the inmates are the guards, and they have this pride in this thing they've built. They've built their own prison, and so they exist in a state of schizophrenia, where they are both guards and prisoners, and as a result, they no longer have, having been lobotomized, the capacity to leave the prison they've made or to even see it as a prison, and he said, escape before it's too late. See, actually, for two or three years now, Chiquita and I have had this very unpleasant feeling that we really should get out. Of course, the problem is where to go, because it seems quite obvious that the whole world is going in the same direction. See, I think it's quite possible that the 1960s represented the last burst of the human being before it was extinguished and that this is the beginning of the rest of the future now, that from now on, there'll simply be all these robots walking around, feeling nothing, thinking nothing. And there'll be nobody left almost to remind them that there once was a species called a human being with feelings and thoughts, and that history and memory are right now being erased, and soon nobody will really remember that life existed on the planet.
many of you may recognize the clips from the movie Elysium came out several years ago, a decade or so, 2013 maybe. And it, it showed a world where the surface, extreme poverty, the elites lived in the air. We talked about this at the end of our Investigating Babylon series. This was the plan that um, is announced. We're going to review uh, Jeff Bezos' speech specifically about that, um, where, of course, it's all under the guise of climate change, controlling what's happening. And uh, he claims that they would like to have millions of people living in the air, in, in, in what they call space. Now, we understand the, the description of reality is enclosed and there is no true deep outer space. And there's, you know, but by technical definition, they get away with this kind of language because I think, according to the military, anything over 65,000 feet is classified as space. And as we talked about Mother Babylon, its location, ancient Vimanas, their capabilities, all of it can easily travel above that and no problem. Um, this is this is just a part of it. But we we don't want to fall into believing all the lies shown to us from the enemy, because as you saw, the enemy will show you a wonderful utopian look. But the actual when you start crunching the numbers and you see the reality of the policies of what they want to do with climate change, they want to reduce the population. They want to reduce the actual wealth levels of the nations, like I said, because they're funneling it into their class, into their power. This is what a huge transfer of wealth just happened in the past couple of years when they forced people not to go to work and shut down entire economies for no, no true emergency. So this is unrighteousness. This is oppression. And even though they paint a pretty future, it's as if the false prophets of ancient Israel lying to the kings, to the rebellious kings of ancient Israel, instead of a true prophet like Isaiah, who would come with a harsh word from the Lord because it was truth. And they're not painting a pretty picture of the future with all the oppression and bribery and injustice that's happening financially and legislatively within a nation. So in Isaiah 14, 20 through 22, you have this unique conversation where Yahweh is reprimanding Israel. And he says, you will not join them in burial. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, before we get into that, I, I got ahead of myself. This is actually speaking about the king of the first king of Babylon. And this is Isaiah 14, where it goes over this unique summary, if you will, from start to finish of the first king of Babylon. And some of it's even in the future. And this particular part is talking about his death and how he's not buried with the people like the other kings like normal. But, and there's for a reason that the father is going to stop at, at a point in time. He's going to stop Babylon from doing this type of behavior that we covered in our Investigating Babylon series, part 10 and 11. So in Isaiah 14, 20 through 22, Yahweh says, You will not join them in burial since you have destroyed your land and slaughtered your own people. The offspring of the wicked will never again be mentioned. Prepare a place to slaughter his sons for the iniquity of their fathers. They will never rise up to possess a land or cover the earth with their cities. I will rise up against them, declares the Lord of hosts. I will cut off from Babylon her name and her remnants, her offspring and her posterity. So this particular word that's being used for cities in this particular passage, it's used in a wide variety of ways in Scripture. And yes, it's used for uh, all types of cities. It's used for encampments, small places, villages. It's used for storehouse cities. It's used for military encampment cities, which is what you would call fortified cities. This is what the spies of Israel went in Numbers 13, came back, reported to Moses uh, that the, the cities in the land of Canaan were all fortified with walls up to the heaven and that uh, there were giants there and that the land devoured itself. And that has a lot of meaning because this is the practices of Babylon to control the people. They always build a city like we heard with the overlay of the of the, the dialogue from my dinner with Andre movie, this unique little movie from 1981. The new city of enslavement in Babylon is for the people to relish a city. So as you see in our culture, guys, they get us to root for cities. There's a famous joke that um, Jerry Seinfeld said like 20 years ago, and he said, what are we doing with this sports stuff? He goes, we're just rooting for laundry. Because if you move from Philadelphia 
and you moved to Minnesota. Now you're you're rooting for the Vikings and not the Eagles. He's like, you're you're not you're just rooting for laundry, but it gets people passionate. The Dallas Cowboys, San Francisco 49ers, right? It gets people passionate about rooting for a specific city with sports teams or with some sort of pride. I mean, it's well known in the music industry and in the fashion industry that New York, the city of New York and in New York, the state of New York, that the city of New York City is a brand unto itself. There's marketing campaigns to brand the city as a destination, not just for tourism, but for living as a, as a longstanding marketing campaign to brand the city itself. There's uh, there's lots of you know fun sci-fi movies about future cities that are the hub that everyone has a great allegiance to. And this is the mindset, part of the indoctrination that pushes people towards worship of a city. Think about how people talk about wanting to go to, to Dubai because it's this amazing, incredible city where they go to do all this stuff. Oh, I'd love to live there. I'd love to be there. I love to, That's where all the people are. They, you know, they, they, there's this atmosphere that is created around specific cities. And rightly so, the enemy has learned over time Instead of building massive fortified cities like they did in the past, which kept the people in to a degree, and they would close the gates of the city, depending upon the ruler and governor or prince or king. Well, now they just have passports, right? Now they have blocked highways for you to come and go. Now they have, you know, this idea of keeping you there with your work and your play and your activities as much as possible. And you being a part of it with all, you know, all willing patronage, if I could put it like that. But the city itself, the idea of the city, what goes on in the city, because of the, the physical proximity of people living closely, it breeds opportunity for corruption and oppression. So this is why we see this wonderful example in the scriptures about the father asking Israel when he brought them into the land, he, you know, he, there was just a couple of million of them at that time. He could have taken them all into one area and had them populate and build a, a, a nice sized city. But instead, he spread them out into their tribes, into their different territories, over hundreds and hundreds of miles in different directions. And as they conquered the people of those areas that were that were there by sedition, that had already broken a covenant to be there and murdered people to be there, as they kicked those sedition and murderers out, there were cities left over that were sparsely spread around that they had populated those cities instead of coming together and building a single large city metropolis, if I could put it like that. So there was a reason the father wanted them to go into the land, into different territories, and don't, don't coagulate in one little territory. There's multiple cities you can spread out into and have plenty of room to grow yourself and your families. It is an original intention from the father. So in addition to the father acknowledging the first king of Babylon and the ways of Babylon is to go and spread the earth with cities because it concentrates people and allows for greater access to control people. The father also promises that he will deal with the Assyrian in the last days. The Lord of hosts has sworn, surely as I have planned, so will it be. As I have purposed, so will it stand. I will break Assyria in my land. I will trample him on my mountains. It's never happened with any king of Assyria. That's never happened with, with Nebuchadnezzar. That didn't happen with anybody. That's yet to come. His yoke will be taken off my people, his burden removed from their shoulders. This is the plan devised for the whole earth. This is the hand stretched out over all the nations. The Lord of hosts is purposed and can thwart him. His, and who can thwart him? His hand is outstretched, so who can turn it back? So in Habakkuk chapter 2, 6 through 8, it says, Will not all these take up a ton against him, speaking with mockery and derision? Woe to him who amasses what is not his and makes himself rich with many loans. Look at this, guys. The scripture is talking about financial corruption way back in the day, 7th century BC. They the father understood how these things happen and oppression happens financially. Woe to him who amasses what's not his and makes himself rich with many loans. Guys, this is fractional reserve banking. This is what has created such poverty and disruption of the economy in the world today. How long will this go on? 
Will not creditors suddenly arise and those who disturb you awaken? Then you will become the prey. Right? That's that that verse is literally like the the sarcastic underpinning to the movie Fight Club, where they're doing all they can to try to create this little secret project mayhem where they can take down the creditors. I'm not advocating for that at all. I'm just saying that's the natural when people start to realize they're being conned by the financial institutions, it leads them to want to do stuff. Because you have plundered many nations, the remnant of the plunder, excuse me, the remnant of the people will plunder you. Because of your bloodshed against man and your violence against the land, the city, and all their dwellers. Some interesting conversation going on back in the day. Habakkuk 2, 9-13 goes on to say, Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, to place his nest on high and escape the hand of disaster. What have we been talking about? What what did we talk about with the Investigating Babylon series that we showed that the elites announced their plan with Jeff Bezos literally giving a speech about it, how they want people to live in the sky above and this would be better for the environment on the ground, but they want people to live in the sky above. Now that, if, if you think that they're going to allow people with no money to go live in the sky above, you know, welcome to life. I think you might need to look around a little bit more. That's an abode for the elite. I'm not saying that every person of wealth has done it through unjust gain, but there's a lot of wealth made through unjust gain. And that makes them into a club of, like we talked about before, this breakaway civilization where the elites are at the top and they get the best contracts with the governments. They get the best, um, you know, uh, positions for bidding on contracts for different things across the world multinational corporations. And sometimes, as in the case of the pharmacia corporations, they get subsidized by taxpayer money to make their product and it's forced on people. This is unjust gain. <laughs> so Habakkuk says, woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain to place his nest on high and escape the hand of disaster. What is the point of what they've been saying about the whole global climate change is they want to build houses high up because the land is going to be, you know, losing all of its coastlines and undergoing all kinds of horrific ecological changes because of quote unquote climate change. The, n there's nothing new under the sun. It says you've plotted shame for your house by cutting off many peoples and forfeiting your life. For the stones will cry out from the wall, the rafters will echo it from the woodwork. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by iniquity. It is not indeed from the Lord of hosts that the labor of the people only feeds the fire, and the nations weary themselves in vain. So here we have a direct statement from the prophet Habakkuk, which whom is you know speaking a message from the Lord, explaining that it is not the will of Yahweh that people would labor to only feed the fire. Like that's a, you know, it's a little expression to say that your daily activity profits you so little that you basically barely afford to keep yourself warm. Like that's oppression. That's unjust. That's not the way he created life. This is the result of men going after unjust gain. It's, I mean, it's crazy. So let's look at the mega projects. Speaking of building a city with unrighteousness and building a city with unjust gain, let's look at some of the mega projects that nations around the world are planning. And all of these nations have incredible poverty and uh, economic dysfunction. But they're ready to, to build and, re and funnel resources into insane mega projects. It's, it's wild to me. One second, let me pull this up. Is it showing? It is showing. Okay, one second. Number four, X Seed 4000. 
The idea for the XSEED 4000 skyscraper was created in 1995 by the Taisei Corporation as an innovative way to develop more housing in Japan. With a height of 4 kilometers or 2.5 miles, it would be taller than Mount Fuji. The goal was to create a city inside of a building with shopping malls and grocery stores so that residents would never have to leave. The skyscraper would offer enough housing to accommodate up to 1 million people. The project was also meant as a way to inspire others to create more unconventional skyscrapers that relied on clean energy. The Taisei Corporation planned to run the tower completely on solar power, although they were not entirely sure about how they could get their hands on so much energy. In order to accommodate for the wide base necessary for such a building, the architects envisioned that the skyscraper would have to be located on the Pacific Ring of Fire. If built, the XSEED 4000 would be the tallest skyscraper in the world by far, and the most expensive, with a price tag of $900 billion. Sorry guys, thanks. So I know that this one's large. I know that this uh, this particular X tower that they're talking about is um, the X seed, what is what they're gonna call it, which is crazy. Crazy name in itself, right? I know that they uh, it looks massive and it is. 900 billion seems like a lot and it is to the average person, but to billionaires who all get together and over time try to fund something like this, it's feasible especially when governments get involved and start donating government resources to it. But what they're going to show next is even more massive. Like it's just off the charts and what they're going to name it. They've actually went to the United Nations. Uh, I can't, I think it was like the economic council or something like that uh, to talk about this and get this proposal for, for the next thing they're about to show you they want to build and what they want to actually name it. It's, it's unbelievable. Some estimates claim that the cost of construction would be even higher, up to $1.7 trillion. The building would be made with 3 million tons of steel, which is enough to build 300 Eiffel Towers. The exact time it would take for the XSEED 4000 to become a reality is unknown, since architects believe a project of this size might not yet be possible. Although there were rumors that the Taisei Corporation was working on building the XSEED 4000 back in 2007, the company confirmed that there are still some kinks to be worked out before they can start on such a big project. Number 3. Tokyo Tower of Babel Another city within a skyscraper, the concept of the Tokyo Tower of Babel came to life in 1992. It was originally presented at the Global Environment Summit in Brazil by the Toshio Ojima Laboratory from Waseda University. With a height of 10 kilometers or 33,000 feet, it would be even taller than Mount Everest and even higher than the average airplane flies. That means the skyscraper would not just be the tallest tower, but the tallest object on planet Earth. In order for such a tall tower to be built, architects would need a base of around 4,100 square kilometers. That would be over two times the size of Houston, Texas. They literally call it Once the Tower finished, of Babel. The building would be large enough to house 30 million people. At the proposed time of construction, the Japanese economy completely crashed, so the building never saw the light of day. Even though the nation has since recovered, it looks like the project may be too pricey to ever become a reality. Construction would cost approximately $306 trillion. Plus, it would take up to 150 years for the Tokyo Tower of Babel to be complete. Number 2 Yeah, not, not only did they pitch it to international people, but they've actually, you know, they actually were planning to start building it. And then, you know, the economy got rough in Japan. Again, why I think that it, they don't have to worry about building it 
um, truly, I mean, you're trying to build something that's six miles high. I don't think they have to worry about building it. I mean, they already had the Shimizu pyramid they, that Tokyo offered uh, to build that they said it would take 30 years. And, um, and it was going to be able to house a million people and they were going to have it sitting in the, in the Tokyo Bay. It was a big pyramid. <laughs> um, but to build an ancient Tower of Babel again, which be even bigger than what Jubilees describes the original Tower of Babel, it's, I, to me, I think it's just getting it in the minds of the people that, hey, we, we feel confident we can do something like this. But as we go further into this particular installment in the series, you're going to see how their narrative is to introduce things to get your mind thinking about. Because remember, it's all, they're preparing you for the dragon. This is what the breakaway civilization's true goal is. It's not to live alone. They serve a master. The, pe the elites that are dealing with their peoples and their populations with unrighteousness, they serve the master of the dragon. They're waiting to prep for the right time and the right conditions, they've prepped the world to receive him again. This has to happen before the world worships him and allows him to give authority to this other character, the first beast Apollyon that shows up. So this is what we're seeing the world being prepped for now that we have worldwide communication and media in the last hundred years. Now, a lot of people might be going, wait a minute, we had ships and telegraphs in the 1800. Yeah, I get it, but I'm talking like instant. We have now instantly people all of the earth can have the same message given to them in their language so they can prep the masses with the right propaganda faster and stronger okay so there's 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 so much so as we talked about that was the the two the x seed which was a massive city hold nine million people and then this other tokyo tower babel that they talked about building and the all idea again if anyone's ever seen an aerial view of Tokyo, they're all crammed in. 27 million people, some some estimates are 30 million, crammed into the Tokyo Bay area. Mount Fuji's in the background, like 40 miles away, maybe, maybe more. And, you know, there's, Japan's not the biggest island, but there's a lot more Japan to grow and, and build on. But everyone's getting crammed in. This is what they do with lots of large cities across the earth is they want to cram people into population centers and offer as many conveniences as possible for you to live there as well as work and opportunity because people aren't being taught natural ways to sustain themselves anymore. That's the, that's the, the trade-off, right? They stop teaching you how to grow your own food, build your own houses, secure your own water source. Well, then naturally you're going to run to whatever city has all those things. So they pull people into the population centers where they can control them. And they're doing this with, they're promoting this idea for the next 30 to 40 years to try to make this as popular as possible all over the earth. Let's look at another one real quick that they're trying to uh, promote as well. have seen this well just about everywhere it's the architectural concept that broke the internet saudi arabia has just shocked the world At first i thought it was a metaverse project but it is a real project saudi arabia wants to build a city dubbed the line the lion i want no part of that i'm gonna be reacting to the line this is definitely just a way for those in power to have more control the ingenious design of the city of future it's designed in three dimensions who do you think is going to be at the top the line is a 170 kilometer long, 500 meter high mirrored linear city in the desert that either represents the cutting edge of architecture or a grim dystopian future, depending on who you ask. But what exactly is the line? How would it even work? And what can it teach us about our cities today? Back in 2021, Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia Mohammed bin Salman first announced plans for a new kind of sci-fi-like city called the Line. We will the Line. A million kilos. It's part of Neom, the kingdom's new nation-building megadevelopment that'll stretch across 26,000 square kilometers of desert. The line's been pitched as a futuristic eco-city north of the Red Sea with no cars, no streets, and no carbon emissions. 
The Saudi government says it will create housing for more than 9 million people. And leaked documents reportedly show ideas for everything from robot maids to an artificial moon, flying cars, and just about everything else from the Jetsons. Think Dubai on steroids. The main question is not so much how or when, but why. And uh, why do we need to build such a city? Why do we need to deploy those kind of resources for that kind of project? And why does the city need to look like that? The entire Neom development is supposed to become so self-sufficient that it's being referred to as a country within a country. A place where residents will apparently be called Neomians rather than Saudis. Now, it's no secret that Saudi Arabia has been attempting to rebrand itself on the world stage, looking to the UAE as a template for a post-oil economy, along with the pie-in-the-sky megaprojects that seem to go with that. It has been folded into what is known as Vision 2030, which basically says that by the end of this decade, Saudi Arabia will look dramatically different. It won't be a, a kingdom relying on oil anymore. Real estate is a big component of that plan. It wasn't until July of 2022 that we got our first glimpse of what a linear city could actually look like outside of the science fiction movies. And it was unlike anything any of us had ever seen before. The city would essentially be sandwiched between two enormous structures that rise 500 meters into the sky and then stretch for 170 kilometers into the desert. Easily the largest buildings ever constructed. They'd also be mirrored, and the idea of that is to minimize their impact on the surrounding environment. The 200 meter gap between these massive skyscrapers is where the city would then lie. Here there'd be a high-speed rail line connecting residents end-to-end -end in 20 minutes, eliminating the need for cars or roads. Homes, public parks, schools and offices will all be layered on top of each other, meaning that every amenity is accessible within a five-minute walk, while parks and nature will be accessible from anywhere in the city within just a two-minute walk. The whole thing takes the concept of the 15-minute city and explodes it. According to Neom, the entire city is going to be powered by renewable energy, and its minimal physical footprint will ensure that 95% of its land will be preserved as it is, a far cry from the urban sprawl of some modern cities that have now reached the size of small nations. But little's actually known about the city itself, outside of the trailer and the glossy renderings. We do know that initial earthworks began back in October 2021, and that the first residents could start moving in by 2030. But aside from that, the project is mostly defined by its questions. And there are a lot of questions. Can you even build something like this? Can you have a city without cars, without streets or roads? What if everything you ever needed was within a five minute walk? Could we live in a hyper planned place that didn't disrupt nature? Is a giant mirror in the middle of an Arabian desert a good idea? And how would the city evolve over time? Strangely enough, there are many concepts on display here that aren't entirely new. For instance, a linear city has been dreamed up before, but not as a utopia, instead as a warning. The Italian architecture collective Superstudio created the continuous movement in 1969, a series of collages depicting vast blocks encircling the world, cutting through cities, mountains and valleys in much the same way that the line does. These striking artworks were meant as a criticism against mass urbanization, against cold, relentless architecture. From an architectural perspective, the line as a concept is not new, uh, has very deep roots. The main difference to me is how this city will heavily rely on technologies that are not quite ready yet. As for the other areas of the city, some of it may not be as far-fetched as you might think. Many of our urban areas are already making changes to take cars off the road and prioritize walkability. There are digital twins of entire cities and programs that can regulate buildings remotely. And Neom is far from the only vision of a so-called smart city. Bjork Ingels Group made headlines in 2020 when it introduced the woven city that would be built near Japan's Fujiyama. It imagines a fully autonomous future with driverless vehicles and AI systems. There's also Egypt's new smart city that's being built near Cairo and Telosa, a utopian vision for a new American metropolis. Now, none of these projects are perfect and they've all got their fair share of criticism, but 
perhaps it is worth rethinking how our cities are structured. Right now, our modern urban areas don't work for everyone. One in every 52 people in London are homeless, while more than a million UK residents live in so-called food deserts, areas that have limited access to cheap, fresh food. In case you hadn't already... And just, just so everyone understands, that is the narrative that's being pushed, is that the reason we have to build these megacities and create, you know, walkability to places for food and water and parks and things like that. It's a stupid, poor straw man excuse because instead of just teaching people how to procure water through natural wells, instead of teaching people how to grow food, instead of, instead of having common sense laws within your city that incentivizes businesses so that more grocery stores and more food transportation services can, can begin in your city and in your region, they're just, continuing to crunch down on people while painting a picture to say that, oh, because of these lack of necessities. Well, the only reason there's a lack of necessities is because of the bad agenda policies that are being put into place to siphon money, restrict the flow of wealth from the middle class and funnel it all to the top. So this is why when you have little propaganda pieces like even though this particular um, video that's that's reviewing Neom and the line, um, even though they seem like there's some skeptical questions there, at the end, he's curtailing all of this with the propaganda of, well, this is truly why they would need to build cities like this because of minorities being discriminated against in other cities, food deserts. You're like, bro, they could fix those in those problems if people would just start acting right. The cities that are currently existing, the places that are currently existing, they could fix those issues in a heartbeat but they're greedy, they're unjust, you know, they're institutional politicians. So there's a reason why those things don't get fixed. You noticed the line is a pretty bold idea, but it's supposed to be. And perhaps bold ideas are what we need to generate global debates around how to fix our built environments. Mirrored monoliths aside, more efficiently run cities with access to nature and local amenities for all, might not be too far from where we really should be aiming. Sorry about that, guys. Try not to let the the uh, the replay happen in the mic, and so I'm trying to mute to keep it. And then I just got to remember to unmute. Thanks for your patience. Um, so why why build a city in the desert, right? And it's hilarious. The guys at the end is like, yeah, maybe these maybe these um, these cities need to be built so we, people can have you know closer access to to wildlife and all that. And I'm like, they already have access to wildlife. People just don't go outside. They're encouraged to stay in. They have to work two jobs within the city they live in to pay just for their heat. Remember the thing that Isaiah was talking about, which is oppression. So thank you, uh, moderators, for taking care of the trolls in the live chat. So it, it's one of those, all of it's a straw man argument that's painted to make you look away from where the money is being stolen. And then they give you the, the shiny new object to make you think that you're being taken care of, that they have your best interests in mind when they really don't. Why would you build this in the desert? A lot of people would say, well, Saudi Arabia is mostly desert. You're going to have to build it there. But did you see where it was actually built? All the coastline next to it? That's They're building it strategically right next to uh, the Gulf. Why not just build a city right next to the coastline and build mass irrigation systems they're already talking about the desalination efforts they're going to have to put in for Neom to, to exist and for the, the line to exist. Oh, great. You have desalination machines. Awesome. What about wells? Do you think that that water doesn't seep into the actual table, the water table of the, of the bedrock of the land below the desert? Like this is, this is known almost all over the world that you can drill for water. Sometimes it's deeper than others. Yes. But in the same way they drill for oil, they also can drill for water. So why not just populate the coastline, the massive, massive coastline of the Gulf Coast and, and Saudi Arabia, its eastern coastline? 
with a massive of them and you could build massive forests and vegetations built off proper irrigation from the ocean with desalination people always say well desalination is too expensive you think a 40-year project for hundreds of billions of dollars is not expensive it's all about control as you can tell it's all about control why put people between two walls think about how little sunlight you'll get every day only when it's overhead in a certain little spot you see the sun every day if it's the right time of the year like think about the lack of vitamin d you would have and what happens if someone actually attacks you it's not a city that's technically built as a fortified city even though it kind of has reminiscence of that ancient concept but if it's just made of literal glass on the outside that's you know that's not that's not doesn't sound like a great plan to me if someone tries to attack you from boats from the sea right next door because what's going to happen if you can't get out it's going to fall in on itself who's inside of it all the people it's a big prison guys they're building a big shiny prison that makes the inmates think that they're in control that's all it is and guess what the the uh the saudi mbs is what they call him basically but he's the saudi uh, prince he actually this is an article that uh, time magazine did when they were quoting uh the wall street journal how they did a write-up in 2019 on the line and the project for the line and the saudi prince talked about how this you know there would be some requirements for neom so i'll read th this part of the article just real quick it says a as mbs conjures this brave new world no journey will take more than 20 minutes zero carbon emissions you get the sense that the chutzpah is nothing short of meta metaphysical he appears to believe that nature itself is as is at his command this shouldn't be entirely surprising because mbs has been promoting equally outlandish ideas since 2017 when he first introduced neom the broader futurist development of which the line forms a part the name is a portmanteau of greek and arabic words for new and future the neon prospectus described a new way of life from birth to death reaching genetic mutations to increase human strength and iq so this whole thing in case you didn't understand or catch that that drift the whole thing is based on transhumanist ideals from birth to death they're going to mess with your dna if you live in this city of neon it's a prison they're asking you to be a live lab rat Come live in this shiny little little <laughs> line, little box, little extended box. It's wild. What does the Father tell us in the scriptures? The Father tells us, Genesis 128, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish, the sea, the birds of the air, every creature that crawls upon the earth. Again, in Genesis 9, after the flood, he tells Noah and his family, getting off the boat god blessed noah and his sons and said to them be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth don't centralize in these little cities and fight for resources and wonder why you don't have clean water fill the earth spread abroad this basic command to mankind in the very very beginning is the thing that the enemy is coordinating with the nations to get people to reject this idea in the same way he did at the Tower of Babel. We're going to go over that in here in a little bit. It's the same plan rehashed with shiny objects, shiny cities, flying drones, potential for flying cars or whatever, instant food delivery, socialist Medicare medicines. We're going to talk about that in a minute, how they, they you know, this particular uh, city in the U.S., this billionaire, Mark Loco in the U.S., he's trying to create this city called Tolosa and how he loves this Swedish government's idea for health care. I mean, it's just socialism. And it's not actually effective in Europe, but people always claim it is because they love socialism because socialism is a part of the authoritarian, the collectivistic authoritarian government structure that is a part of the Babylonian system that we talked about in our Investigating Babylon series. The Father wants you to spread out. It's like it's like Mo from the from the Three Stooges. Spread out. He's always getting 
Larry and Curly getting too close. He's like, I need some room spread out. The father has made mankind to live not together, not, excuse me, say this right way, not live cram packed together in massive cities without enough space to walk around, to take your shoes off and go walk in the grass or whatever. Like there's plenty of earth. We've got to take care of it. And we're going to talk about that in this, in this installment as well. This is the basic command from the beginning that they're trying to get mankind to override. So this is what we just looked at. This is the line that we just saw a breakdown of from the Persian Gulf. Um, I think that goes up into the Red Sea on the eastern side of Saudi Arabia. And Egypt is next door. Egypt, by the way, they're also building a massive uh, obelisk building that's like 150 stories tall that looks like a massive obelisk shaped exactly like an obelisk as a part of their new futuristic smart city that they're trying to build and it's going to be housing and offices and a whole bunch of stuff and it's just a massive obelisk <laughs> it's wild but the line is going to be supposedly 100 miles long now a lot of people are probably looking at me going now sean like this you know maybe maybe this will be like the um like that Tokyo project with the Tokyo Tower of Babel where they end up having to scrap it because they realize it's probably just too much effort. Has anyone seen Mecca? Has anyone seen Saudi Arabia and what they've been building? Has anyone seen their plans for Riyadh and what they've already accomplished? They're not joking, guys. Then they've got the money. And did you hear, I don't know if you heard in the breakdown with Neom specifically. Now, the line, what we're seeing here, this line, this 100-mile stretch of city they want to build, it's just a part of a greater landmass that is considered the independent city of Neom. There's two other mega cities they plan to build inside the greater area landmass of Neom. So they've blocked off an area called Neom that's actually, that's what you were saying earlier, it's like 26,000 square miles. It's, it's not just one city, it's multiple cities inside this city state. It's been, it, without saying these words, this is what they're describing. You're describing an ancient city-state. Even though it's going to be governed in the control of the Saudi government, it's going to have its own independent laws and, and will not um, have to acquiesce to the specific religious requirements of the rest of Saudi Arabia. So it's going to be a tourist-friendly place where people from all over the world can come and they don't have to abide by some of the stricter laws of Islam. So... They're intending to make this a megapolis, a massive area where there's multiple large cities inside of it. The line is just a part of that structure. And me, people might say, well, maybe it's going to be too big. They'll probably abandon it. And I'm like, guys, Dubai was built in 20 years. We went over this in the, in, you know, the first episode of Investigating Babylon series. They built that in 20 years. It's bigger than New York City. It's prettier than New York City. It's nicer. It's first world. It's mega skyscrapers. You know, all the mega cranes. Half of them at all times are in Dubai. Half of them that are existing in the world, those mega cranes, there's only so many of them across the world. Half of them are in Dubai at all times and have been for the last 15 years. Like they're, they're constantly building. So it's not impossible for them to say 30, 40 years, they could put up 100 miles of, uh, of this type of structure and have people start living in it already. But the people that are start living in it, like I just tried to share with you, there's some requirements of you. Remember, they're building an allegiance to you. And they want to genetic, be able to genetically modify you before you can live in Neom. That's, that's crazy. It's crazy. Talk about allegiance, right? Talk about trying to connect you to a specific area so you don't want to leave. That's just, it's amazing to me. It's truly amazing. Um, this is another part of Neom that they're try trying to build. I didn't really um, have time to... I don't have time to go into this is the Ox octagon is what they're hoping to build. It's a city that's partly on land and also a floating city. And it's going to be a storage city that's completely automated and run with, you know, machines. And it's also going to be, since it's on the waterline of the Gulf, um, it's going to be a huge trade hub that ships come in and out of and trade with. And it's going to be supposedly a city plus a huge, massive docking and storage facility. Um, that's also a part of Neom as well. It's amazing. It's partly a floating city, right? Because what's what was I talking about? They, they, the initial command for the father was to go fill the earth. Fill the land. Go out and spread around. Fill the land. It's great. Enjoy. I made it all for you. Go fill the, fill the earth. 
Babylon wants you to centralize. They also are now propagating the ideas of get off the land. You're hurting the land. We were made to live on the land. It's a part of our health. It's good for us to live in the land. They want you to live in the sky and they've propagated that idea. We've talked about it. We're going to talk about it some more in this, in this installment. And they also are trying to build cities that are floating on the ocean to get you living off the land on the water. The oxygen city of Neom is going to be a, be a part of that. But there's other countries already involved in this. South Korea, they're already building a floating city. Japan also plans to build a floating city. The Maldives is already building their own floating city. So this is, is very interesting dynamic that the, that the powers that be are trying to get people centralized and off the land. If you're going to stay on the land, they want you centralized so they can control you because this is how they, they control you through law, property, and, and financial corruption. Isaiah chapter 5, they were, <laughs> Israel was going through the same type of thing. Nothing new under the sun, guys. Isaiah 5, 8 through 10 in the Septuagint. Woe to them that join house to house and add field to field, that they may take away something of their neighbors. Will you dwell alone upon the land? For these things have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. For though many houses shall be built, many and fair houses shall be desolate, and there shall be no inhabitants in them. For when ten yoke of oxen plow the land, excuse me, for when ten yoke of oxen plow, the land shall yield one jar full, and he that sows six homers shall produce only three measures. This is explaining to you that the economy is broken, where these people are doing this financial corruption by coagulating people together, house to house, field to field. It's not what was intended. There's, there's, I mean, the Father's wisdom has been here since the beginning. And all of this that we're seeing put onto the world is the opposite of the Father's wisdom. So we're going to look at the, the Great Green Wall of Africa because that uh, was another project that they tried to do recently, which is just it's amazing. 2007 is when they started this. And they can't get it done. And we'll talk about it after we look at this short clip. Um that breaks it, breaks it down and what it was. The idea of the Great Green Wall was introduced in 2007, an effort to limit the desertification and contain the Sahara Desert. But with climate change in full swing and with it rising temperatures and lack of rainfall, millions of trees that were part of the Green Wall died. Authorities now have to come up with alternatives. Take a look at this next report. The idea of the Great Green Wall was introduced by the African Union in 2007 to contain the Sahara Desert and help create green and temperate agricultural pockets. The plan here was to plant a 5,000 million long boundary of trees. But with climate change, that goal has fallen by the wayside. Millions of trees died due to lack of rainfall and soaring temperatures. Organizers have now been forced to regroup and rethink their strategy. Their plan is now to focus on smaller clusters of trees instead of one long belt. Any project has to start from the communities if you want it to be sustainable and that is what we call community ownership. These are the two elements that guarantee the sustainability of projects. These smaller pockets have in fact proved to be beneficial. In many cases they have helped enrich soil and also served economically for the local farmers. Take the example of Fall here, who owns a citrus orchard. Fall grabbed the chance to plant one near a water source after a municipality meeting with village chiefs for discussing options for utilizing their land. Fall is not the only one. There are about 800 such success stories. This has even helped cut down the cost of having to buy basic food supplies. Here the water is the main source of occupation. On days when we have enough, we can water vegetable fields, which will provide us with income, and as a result, we will be able to support our husbands with the daily expenses. 
It has been over a decade since the Great Green Wall project was introduced. Since then, only about 4% of the target has been met. As per estimates, 43 billion US dollars would be needed to reach the 2030 target. And so, organizers are shifting their attention to smaller and more sustainable ways. And community-driven projects like these seem to be doing the trick, at least for now. At the recently concluded COP26, African Development Bank President Akinwumi Adesina spoke about the importance of stopping desertification in the Sahel, also announcing a commitment from the bank to mobilize $6.5 billion toward the Great Green Wall by 2025. Does anyone know why? Okay, so let me let me back up. I love that this I love that this uh, African news agency put this up on YouTube because I got to go into the comments and I got to look at what people were saying in the comments. And so many people were saying uh, the reason that this didn't work was because of actual warfare. And. I was like, huh, that's interesting. Because they said there was, once they did it in smaller pockets near local water sources, near near local water sources, that suddenly it, it was working better in smaller pockets. And I was thinking to myself, well, why didn't it work across the entirety? Because look, this is, this is what they wanted to do over almost 8,000 miles across Europe or across uh, Africa, the bulk of Africa. They wanted to actually put in a, a new green belt, right? Across the bulk of Africa, through all these countries. Eritrea, Ethiopia, Sudan, Chad, Niger, Nigeria, Mali, uh, Mauritania, Senegal, all these different countries, right? But then I thought to myself, well, why didn't it work all the way across? Why wouldn't it just, you know, why only in certain pockets? Oh, that's because there's massive warfare going on in, in Africa and has been for a long time, just like the people in the comments are saying. And in these specific regions too. So I took the, the map of the warfare overlaid it onto their projected plan for the Great Green Wall of Africa, and lo and behold, it's right in the path. <laughs> it, it, it's not rocket science, guys. Father tells you, if you don't follow his commands, your, your, your sky is like bronze and your dirt is like iron. You have famine. Things are not going to grow. <laughs> it's it's not that difficult. It amazes me. So this is what our Heavenly Father promises us, our good and wonderful Father. Leviticus 26, 3 through 5. If you follow my statutes and carefully keep my commandments, I'll give you rains in their season, and the land will yield its produce, and the trees of the field will bear their fruit. Your threshing will continue until the grape harvest. The grape harvest will continue until sowing time. You will have your fill of food to eat, and you dwell securely in the land. So if, if in order for trees to bear their fruit, it gets rain and it is alive. This is why it says, I'll give you rains in their due season. So we just heard the Great Green Walls failed as a whole. Small pockets throughout 8,000 miles. Small pockets are, are thriving. That's wonderful. But you have injustice, murder, bloodshed, oppression happening all through those nations. And it has been a long-standing pattern for a long time. And the father's like, oh, well, this is what happens. The, the whole play, you know, it gets destroyed. Warfare destroys the ecosystem. So it's just, you know, it's like the father has already told us what, what happens if we obey our, his statutes. Oh, we love our neighbor and we don't kill them. So then all of our harvests will be great. Things will be good. It's, a, it's it's amazing, amazing to me. Now, next we're going to look at the false Tolosa. This is one of the super cities that's planned for the United States that I was talking about a minute ago. The name of the city itself is actually called Tolosa. But we're going to break down what that word is. And this is why I'm calling it false Tolosa because of, of what's... Uh, <laughs> because of um, basically the advertisement for this and, and, and how it goes against the word of God. So like we're going to, you know, I'll show you, I'll break it down, here it is. In a world where communities are unsafe and disconnected, imagine a city where every resident is given equitable opportunities to prosper in life. A city where everyone is always safe, welcomed, and included. 
No such paradise exists yet, but an American billionaire has set out to build an ultramodern city that embodies equity, diversity, and inclusion. Join us today as we explore this new upcoming city in America that will set a global standard for urban living. I, I thought a city that is diversity, inclusivity, and equity, I, I thought that would be a behavior. I didn't realize a city could actually cause people to do that. Architecture or the street designs or how close you are to a tree or a park. I thought diversity, inclusion, and equity, and we're going to go over what equity is versus equality here in a little bit. Equity is a communist term, by the way. I, I, I don't understand. Like those are, those are behaviors that the individual has to choose to abide in. So that means someone has to set a definition for those things in this city. And I guess if you don't fit the definition, what happens? Do they remove you from the city? So now it's a city designed... Like I said, these are prisons. It's a, it's a design to force behavior. Not to encourage good behavior. It's to force good behavior. It's it's all going to be a part of a social credit score that they want to inflict. I, I'm really praying that the United States um, is able to not adopt it. I pray that we can, we can get away from it because it's going to get really rough for people if they adopt it because they're going to start setting the standard for what kind of behavior they allow. They're building an entire, they want to build an entire city with this agenda in mind. All right, let's keep going. Telosa, a planned desert city in USA, is a vision of billionaire Mark Lohr that was announced in September 2021. The mission of this project is to create a fairer and more sustainable future city that can become a blueprint for future generations. Mark Lore intends to combine and bring together the best of attributes seen in different cities of the world. You can assume that Telosa will be as vibrant and diverse as New York, combined with the efficiency, safety, and cleanliness of Tokyo, along with the commendable social services and governance model of Stockholm. Wait, I thought this was an American city. Why, why wouldn't it have the government services and structure of a constitutional republic? I hope you guys are catching some of these subtle things here, right? This, this is their, their, their want the whole world to think in a certain way, regardless of where you're born or what country you're part of. Because that whole constitutional kind of thing is, in their minds, is an antiquated tool that, that got them to a certain place. And now they're trying to move everyone else to a different place. So, that's just like Saudi Arabia, with strict religious observance to Islam, is allowing Neom to exist and govern itself and not have the same religious requirements. Do you see how unique of a, of a twist that is? Why wouldn't, why wouldn't they want to have the same observances of Islam where that was their culture, their tradition, their religion? That's what they fight for. That's what they believe in. And I'm not a part of Islam and I'm not, I'm not a Muslim, but at the same time, they, they don't let, you know, there's a lot of things they don't let get away because they're, they have a strict society. It's not considered a liberal open society. But what we're reading about here is they want to build an entire city that is not going to have the same governing authority and system as the rest of the United States and is built off liberal principles, both financial and social. There's, it's impossible to always feel welcomed and always feel safe. You're going to, you mean you're trying to tell me that you can build a city that has no crime? How are you going to do that? I mean, we're just looking at the commercial guys. This is just the, the, the PR piece that the billionaire put together with all the little graphics and digital CGI and everything to, to promote his idea because he's looking for investors. How are you going to actually ensure people are not killing each other in the city so that people always feel safe? You can have some precogs floating in some tubs with, with Tom Cruise hovering above him. Like what, how are you going to actually ensure this? It, it's all based on control. That's how they ensure it. 
you fall in line or they you get kicked out you're ostracized it would be the fairest most open and inclusive city in the world this mega city project targets to house 5 million people by 2050 with 50,000 expected to relocate in the first phase of construction. The location of the project has not yet been finalized. The project's planners intend to build the city somewhere in the desert regions of the U.S. Mark Lohr's idea of a desert city stems from the obvious need to have a city for all, where residents feel integrated and safe, easily reach their place of work and residence, and at the same time feel connected to nature. The name of this megacity Telosa derives from the ancient Greek word telos, which carries the meaning, the highest purpose. The project aims to bring individuals together in society to reach their full potential. Telosa will be an idealistic city, but the... Okay, we're going to go over that word telos in the Greek because it's in scripture. And we're also like, think about what they just promised you with this city. It's... It's named after something that means the highest purpose, and it's designed to help you reach your fullest potential. Oh, really? Interesting. Are you going to teach me how to behave like Yeshua? No. That means they're going to set the standard for what your highest potential is. <laughs> we have to look, you know, read between the lines and look through the marketing language. The need to build this desert city is based on reality. It's a different idea because it will center the people, along with its mission and values, ensuring a bright future for them. Along with its mission and values, ensuring a bright future for them. Let's look at what telos means in Scripture. How it's used in Scripture. Romans 10, 1-4 Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they are zealous for God, but not on the basis of knowledge because they were ignorant of God's right behavior and sought to establish their own through Judaism. This is why that wasn't based on the knowledge and the truth of the embodiment of the law, but on the traditions of Judaism. He says they did not submit to God's right behavior. That's why Yeshua reprimands the Pharisees for leading people astray. For Christ is the end of the law to bring right behavior to everyone who believes. So what does this mean? In this word, telos is used. Strong's 5056. The, it's the word used loosely translated in the English as the end. And many people think, oh my goodness, the end? Does that mean the law is done away with? No, it's not the end. It's not the type of end. You guys have ever heard of a homophone? Something that sounds the same or a synonym, excuse me, sounds the same or it's, it's, it's the same idea, but a different word. It's a synonym. The end, it's not the end as in it's over. It's the end as the principal end, the aim, or the purpose. The principal purpose is the highest purpose. The principal end is the highest purpose, the highest aim. The city is literally named after what we see exemplified in Yeshua, the highest purpose of God's right behavior exemplified in Yeshua's behavior, and he's going to give us that same right behavior at the resurrection. That's why in him we can have our righteousness. They're trying to build a city based on social progressive values, and they want to call it this highest purpose. Where, like I said, if I go in there and I start saying, well, my highest purpose is to follow Yeshua, and he doesn't agree with these two dudes getting together and bumping uglies. So who's, who wins out in that, in that scenario? Are they going to feel safe and included and welcomed in the city where I disagree with their abject, abhorrent behavior, their disease causing literal just health, unhealthy behavior. Do I, who's going to win out in this, this situation? The city of Telos is going to do what? They're going to slash my ESG score and they're going to remove me or tell me I can't live there or raise my rent or tell me I can't go outside or whatever. There has to be enforcement, guys. These these huge things that they're trying to push on the on the mass populace for these utopian cities. It, it's it's all PR. All cities must have regulation of behavior. 
Otherwise, the place will burn down in like three weeks. But what they're getting really good at is the enforcement of law and hiding it, if I could put it like that. So that's why they really they really want to move away from the the overt and obvious police forcing running around the towns with making noise with the cars and the sirens blaring and handcuffing people and everybody watching. They would rather just lock you in your home. Oh, something my door doesn't open. Oh, I can't come out for three days because uh, I offended somebody. Just like we saw a year and a half ago in China, when they're literally welding people shut in their apartments who were trying to leave during the quote unquote pandemic. So this is all a part of a social credit score is the new police force. Again, they they get you to not only build your own prison, but be your own wardens and guards. It's it's all very sadistic. And this is just a huge troll on the Messiah. So I would rather Christ be the principal purpose of the law, which is what he was. He embodied the law without sin. He walked it out perfectly. He's our perfect example of how to live the law with love and do it justly. And he is our high priest who are going to resurrect us on the day of the Lord. So he is the right behavior we model after and we're going to get that right behavior on our new resurrected bodies permanently at the resurrection. That is the promise of the Christian faith. Not some city. But what the city is offering is equity. This is a classic depiction of equality versus equity. But even I think that this particular depiction tries to get you to favor equity, which is the communist cartoon. And they try to say that if you have equality, which they'll say capitalism may give you equality, but it doesn't help people who are less advantaged, the poor, the minority, the, you know, the disabled or whatever. It doesn't help people who are disadvantaged because they all have equality of opportunity. So therefore they show these three different sized peoples, father, son, younger brother, all of them stand on the same size box to try to see the baseball game over the fence. All of it is a straw man example, but this is a famous one, which is why I used it. And it's kind of easy to understand. And then they'll look and they'll say, what we need, and this is what communists and socialists, Babylonian government mentality will say, is what we need is not equality because you see, there's still that odd man out with equality. You still can't see the game. What we need is to help the person who has the disability or the sensitivity or whatever, the blue hair. We need to help that person have the same outcome as everybody else. So you see what they did is they actually took away from the father his box because they said, well, you don't really need it. So we're going to take this away from you and we're going to give it to the younger brother who now he can see. And, it, and, you know, in theory, it sounds amazing, right? Until you realize, wait a minute, they stole the guy on the left. They stole the father's box. What did we read about the scriptures earlier in, in Habakkuk? Those who are taking from others through oppression. But I'm just sitting here going, the, the whole thing is a false paradigm. The whole thing is a, a Hegelian dialectic, right? Why aren't we just removing the fence? Well, you know what I'm saying? Obviously, don't, don't get lost in the baseball game concept because the, the point of this cartoon isn't about the baseball game. It's about their opportunity. So who's putting the fence in front of people? Well, this is what I was talking about, those corrupt policies unrighteous rulers so now but look what even i don't even fully agree honestly with with the liberation part because they've stolen everyone's box and took away the fence but this is you know this is the the in simplistic terms that we could try to think about these ideas on a on a grand scale in simplistic terms why are we not just why why are we taking from others to make things more accessible to people because at some point someone has to decide who doesn't need what they have when i was younger uh, for the first like nine weeks i think of my first grade when i was a kid six years old my father pastored a church at the time and the church actually had its own homeschool it was very interesting um and it was at the church and they had uh, different grade levels and different teachers and everything and um 
they eventually couldn't afford to do it. So they had to, they had to disband it. But for nine months, um, it's, a, it's a long story, but my dad took this church over from a previous pastor and, the, and that previous pastor was embezzling money and there was a whole bunch of problems. And he had a whole bunch of things that he couldn't afford that was going on. And this, this Christian school at the church was part of that. So they eventually had to, you know, um, balance the books and cut the Christian school out. So then after that, I went to public school, but for the first nine months, nine weeks, I'm, I'm in this, this class and, and the, the teacher, she was trying to incentivize the kids with fake money, like monopoly money. And it was money that she had actually made herself and cut out and wrote on it different values. And when you were good, she would go and she would put, you know, a, a bill, a dollar bill, a $2 bill, a $5 bill or whatever on your desk. And then later at the end of the week, you could buy candy with it. And it was to, to you know, to get six year olds to behave and stay still. And I had amassed, I, I was rolling in the dough, man. I had amassed a stack. I was doing good. But the teacher had didn't make enough money, like physical pieces of paper. So after several weeks, I just because I was I was a good little preacher's kid. I had stacked a huge amount of money on my desk, and everyone's money sat on the corner of their desk. So that way she could go and she could she could put it there and you didn't have to like pull it out and she could always see it. And if you were being bad, she could go withdraw some from you. And I had a stack cause I was good. And then one day she went to go give some to some other people and realized that she'd actually ran out of little paper, fake dollars. And so she looks at me and I, I, I look at her and I see, because we all were interested to see who's going to get awarded with money. And I wasn't using mine at the end of the week to buy candy. I was just saving it. She looks at me. I look at her. And it was like in slow motion, she gets up from her desk and walks over and looks down at my stack of money and then just takes all of it back to her desk. So then she had enough to give out to people for what she wanted. I didn't do anything wrong. My behavior was still on point. She decided with these resources Instead of going and procuring new resources, I mean, we're talking fake paper money. She decided she was going to take from me and steal my effort and my value and give it to others. Now, I, this took me a long time to process as a little kid, but I've never forgot it as clearly as you guys can see. I've never forgot it. Like what in the world? What, what kind of grown adult does that? Oh, someone that doesn't understand righteous value and principles of money that doesn't understand what the father, his system of society and governance. But most of the public education in the United States for a long time now is being taught socialist communist values and they don't realize it. And it started mostly in the 1960s. Anyway, very interesting. Very interesting. All right, guys, let's look at this. Let's look at someone that provides a righteous equity, but they don't do it by stealing from people. It's done through kindness and through personal volition to honor God. Second Samuel chapter nine, verse one through four. Then David asked, is there anyone left from the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for the sake of Jonathan? Jonathan was one of the children of, of Saul. Saul and his three sons, Jonathan included, had already been killed by the Philistines several chapters earlier in, in first Samuel chapter 31. And there was a servant of Saul's family named Ziba. They summoned him to David, and the king inquired, Are you Ziba? I am your servant, he replied. So King David asked, Is there anyone left of Saul's family to whom I can show the kindness of God? And Ziba answered, well, There is still John jo Jonathan's son, who is lame in both feet. Where is he? replied the king. And Ziba said, Indeed, he is in Lodabar at the house of Makur, the son of Amiel. So guys, check this out. King David wants to show the kindness of God to his enemy's children, and now his enemy's grandchildren. Now, yes, David loved Jonathan as a friend, so it's not, you know, he's not, uh, he's he's not doing this on Saul's account. He's doing this on Jonathan's account. But he still, what does he call it? He calls it the kindness of God. Think about being the grandson of Saul, thinking that you're just cursed, man. My granddad, like he, he went off the rails, man. He went crazy and. He tried to kill the anointed of God. He tried to kill David. And, he, you know, he just he engaged in all kinds of nonsense and 
tried to go see a witch and like, you know, like my granddad went off the rails and then he died in disgrace without the favor of God in battle. Think about, and then Mephibosheth, even though he has a, apparently has a wife and child, I don't know how he became crippled in both feet, but he now he's lame in both feet, which means it's exceedingly difficult for him to work. James 1 28, what's a pure and undefiled religion? Take care of the orphans, the widows, and the homeless. Keep yourself unpolluted from the world. Here's David exemplifying a pure and undefiled religion. And he's calling it the kindness of God. So he goes and finds the former servant of Saul and as asks, is there anyone of Saul's descendants still left that I can show the kindness of God to? It's just truly beautiful. And there is, and they find him. So King David had him brought from the house of Machir, son of Amiel and Lodabar. And when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he fell down, face down in reverence. And then David said, Mephibosheth, I am your servant, he replied. Do not be afraid. Ah, <sighs> man, this story chokes me up. I mean, Mephibosheth probably thought he was going to be killed, man. I mean, he knew that everyone knew that Saul was trying to kill David. Now David's in control. Now David's in charge of the country. And David said to Mephibosheth, I am your servant. He replied, do not be afraid, said David, for surely I will show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land of your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and said, what is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog like me? You see what I mean? He's, he thinks that he's, he's nothing in this society. And he literally needs a wheelchair. Verse 9 through 11. Then the king summoned Saul's servant Ziba and said to him, I've given to your master's grandson all that belonged to Saul and to all of his house. Guys, think about what we're reading here. It, you, we, oh, thank you so much, Carl. I appreciate the super chat. That's amazing. Yeah, it's really generous of your brother. Thank you so much. We're seeing King David go to his enemy's servant. You know, back in the day, if you guys don't understand ancient history, man, back in the day, they killed everybody. Like if one king took over from the other king, everyone who was loyal to that previous king was killed. Family, grandchildren, aunts, uncles, servants, donkeys, mules, everybody was killed. David's righteous, though. He was able to judge the nuance of the situation and still treat people according to their own behavior. He was righteous. So now he goes to the servant of Saul, the same Saul that was trying to kill David all this time. And he's announcing to Saul, hey man, or to Ziba, the servant, I want to bless your previous master's grandson. It's just beautiful, guys. He says, you and your sons and servants are to work the ground for him and bring in the harvest so that your master's grandson may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, is always to eat at my table. Now, Ziba had 15 sons and 20 servants. Oh, that's that's amazing. 15 sons and 20 servants. There's a little bit of manpower to go around, basically. This is the servant. Think about this, guys. This is the servant of former King Saul. The servant of King Saul has 15 sons and 20 grandsons and 20 servants himself. So he's basically now think about the think about the uh, the cartoon that we just watched, the difference between equitable or equality, excuse me, and equity. This is a moment where someone who's uninformed about the goodness of God and the law of God would look, would say, oh, look. King David is providing equity. He's providing Mephibosheth who can't get a job because he's crippled with this amazing free, free food. He's given him, he's given him his free rations, right? He's given him his uh, EBT card or his, his, his uh, health welfare, but he's also having other people work for him to provide for him. This is not, this is the, this is King David saying, look, I'm returning value where it was, most kings would have kept it and stole it. He's returning the value of King Saul's land to Mephibosheth. And since the land needs to be worked and produce a harvest, he then takes the servant, same servant of King Saul that would have been passed down to Mephibosheth ordinarily. King David is making sure that same servant is passed down to Mephibosheth and works for the benefit of Mephibosheth as a kindness. And that servant now can go out and procure the land and make sure that property is well-maintained and the food is brought in and Mephibosheth is okay and the land doesn't go into disrepair. 
So there, there's a land stewardship as well as keeping the proper law of secession for property rights as well as servants. And he's not stealing from someone else's land to go give it to Mephibosheth. King David didn't just walk into the tribe of Benjamin and just pick out someone's land and says, give that to Mephibosheth and kick the other person out. That's what communism socialism does under their guise of equity. Is they come into a place and they say, you have more than this people over here. Give me that box you're standing on and give it to him. You should be all right. What happens if that guy needed the box for something else more than just looking over the fence? This is a beautiful example in the scriptures. Heart, heartwarming example of how not only is he taking care of the poor, the orphaned, and specifically in this case, someone that's crippled, but he's also making sure the proper legal rights are, are being passed down according to um, HR, human resources, as well as land, um, land valuation and land husbandry. The law of God takes care of all the details, guys. You don't have to steal from one person to give to another. Because that cycle never ends. And as we read in Isaiah 5, over time, or excuse me, I think it was uh, uh, Habakkuk, um, over time, the oppressed rise up against the creditors. They rise up against the people who are amassing wealth through unjust gain or through unjust loans. The predatory reserve fractal banking systems that was invented by people in Tyre and the Canaanites. So this is it's just a beautiful, beautiful story of how the father works. So let's look now that we've seen the perfect example in the father's law, we're going to be studying how there's an imperfect example exemplified by the nations. One second, let me make sure I can find this real quick. Where did it go? Where did it go? Okay, one second. Oh. Huh. It's weird. I thought I Okay, sorry guys, one second. I'm not sure what happened to this video that I prepped. Let's see if it's over here. Where did it go? So we already looked at Tolosa. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Hmm. All right, one second. We'll just have to do it this way. Okay, here we go. We've all seen the flash cars, giant hotels, and lavish lifestyles enjoyed in Dubai. Oil money has made the country rich in just a few generations. But while Dubai's skyline might have been paid for with oil money, it was built with the blood of foreign slave labor. In the UAE, the home of Dubai, only 20% of the population are Emirati. The rest are foreign laborers who are so numerous they actually outnumber the natives. And sure, some of them are rich Westerners making a lot of money, but it's not them I'm interested in. 
It's the workers who come from poorer countries and get taken advantage of, particularly Indians and Pakistanis who make up 40% of the total population. They are lured abroad by promises of good wages and a lifestyle unattainable at home, but it's a trap. Once they make it abroad, their passports are taken from them by their employers, and they are denied an exit visa, making it impossible to leave the country. They are then told the truth. Long hours, low pay, and no way out. In fact, Dubai, the gem of the Middle East, is almost entirely built on foreign slave labour. Once they're trapped, the workers are bused to villages and camps around the outskirts of the city crammed into tiny rooms with intermittent electricity and unreliable water, crammed together like animals. The cost for boarding eats up most of the workers' wages. It's common for expats to send money home as a remittance, but the workers tricked into these schemes just don't make enough to do so. According to official statistics, two migrant workers kill themselves each week, but that doesn't reveal the true extent. The Indian consulate reported 971 deaths of Indian nationals in 2005 alone. That's nearly three a day. But when the Indian consulate released this figure, they were told by the authorities to stop counting. And when the authorities talk, everybody listens. As enshrined by Emirati law, part of the contract the workers sign must legally include a large final payment, which is to cover the cost of the flights back to their home country. So the expats have a reason to keep working, even under poor conditions, instead of revolting. The idea of finally getting back home one day and putting an end to the nightmare is enough hope to keep them going. Regardless, the alternative, walking home through the desert in 50 degree or 120 Fahrenheit heat, just isn't feasible. So the workers slave away 12 hours a day, waiting for their last payment. But in a last cruel twist, the pandemic hit. The oil price crashed and the economy shut down. The government told agencies they had to continue to provide food and shelter to blue collar workers during the pandemic, even if they were laid off in the downturn. So they did. But now many of these companies have went bankrupt, and these workers who were relying on their final payment to get home are truly trapped. Charities come past with food and water when they can, but otherwise the workers are left to go hungry with no way to get home. In the past few months, some consulates have started to order emergency evacuation flights because of this crisis, but it's a lottery. And if you're born in the wrong place, you're out of luck. So you might be wondering, why are the local Emirati not outraged by these inhumane conditions for migrant workers? Well, let's take a look at it from their perspective. There may be no right to vote in the UAE, but for the average young Emirati, the system works. Their grandparents might have struggled for water and food and lived a life of poverty. Nowadays, a young Emirati can live a lifestyle unimaginable to their forebears. They can expect average salaries of over 60,000 US dollars, all whilst the government pays for education up to PhD level, pays for healthcare at home, and if it's not good enough at home, they can travel abroad for treatment. That'll be paid for too. And it doesn't stop there. When you marry, say hello to a free house. Usually a large luxury apartment. On top of that, the cost of living is so low that almost everyone has a maid, a nanny, and a driver. Living standards are unbelievable. And for the morally unscrupulous, they can point to the fact that these practices of taking passports and altering wages are technically illegal, even if there is little enforcement. So don't expect much protest from the Emirati until it becomes so bad that turning a blind eye becomes too much to bear. Ask a lot of people, have you been Yeah, slave East? labor I mean, is, um, is still a thing, guys. Slave labor is still a thing. Um, so let's see. Uh, let's see what our father has to say about this, because he's always had something to say about it. In fact, in his amazing righteous law, he expresses to us how we're to treat these, to treat anyone working for us. Deuteronomy 24, 14 and 15. Do not oppress a hired hand who is poor and needy, whether he is a brother or a foreigner residing in one of your towns. You are to pay his wages each day before sunset because he is poor and depends on them. Otherwise, he may cry out to the Lord against you and you will be guilty of sin. So this is actually something that um, I've talked to my wife about in the past, that in the future, like I have several business ideas and to get to the point where they actually have employees, I'd love to to structure the finances to where I could pay them, you know, uh, prorated their monthly wage. I would pay them every night. I mean, why, why wouldn't we? Right. And I feel like literally paying them daily, even if they're on salary, that's fine, but just divvy it up, pay them daily. There's something about it. There's something about the power of having that money in your hand uh, every day that can benefit the people better. And I, I think there's something um, there's something very, very genius about it to ensure poverty doesn't 
doesn't come up on people within the month. So anyway, I just love to try that in the future. But Yahweh also tells us in Leviticus 19.3, you must not defraud your neighbor or rob him. You must not withhold until morning the wages do a hired hand. I've had wages withheld from me before as a job. Jeremiah 17, 9 through 11, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Guys, we've heard this famous passage before, right? The heart is deceitful above all things who can, and beyond cure. Who could understand it? But what about the context? What's the context of this actual passage? It says, I, Yahweh, search the heart. I examine the mind to reward a man according to his way by what his deeds deserve. Like a partridge hatching eggs, it did not lay is the man who makes a fortune unjustly. In the middle of his days, his riches will desert him, and in the end, he will be the fool. Jeremiah 22, verse 13. Woe to him who builds his palace by unrighteousness and his upper rooms without justice, who makes his countrymen serve without pay and fails to pay their wages. So we can't be impressed by mega cities being built around the world. Many of them, I mean, like I said, not only are they massive prisons, but they're doing it with unjust wages. They're doing it with injustice. They're literally Dubai is built on slave labor. It's it's horrific. But yet people will go over there and think it's a wonderful honor to go over there and, you know, go out to see, you know, their little island nations that they call the world and go to all the attractions and the theme parks and, you know, do, do the Dubai life. But it's built on slave labor. Like, you know. It's, it's, yeah, it's just one of those, it's built on injustice. So what does Yahweh show us? Babylon, mother Babylon is thrown down. In a single hour, your destruction has come. What was the verse that we just read? Um, actually, it was, yeah, in, in his days will be rich to desert him. In the middle of his days, his riches will desert him. In the end, he will be the fool. We see the example in Revelation 18, the mighty angel, throws down a large millstone and says, with such violence will Babylon be thrown down. And in a single hour, your destruction has come. James chapter five, verse one through six. Come now, you who are rich, weep and wail over the misery to come upon you. Your riches have rotted, the moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and consume your flesh like fire. You have hoarded treasure in the last days. Do you guys know that James was prophesying about the last days? Look, the wages you withheld from the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous who did not resist you. Revelation 18, 9-11, The kings of the earth who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her, that's Mother Babylon, mysterious Babylon, will weep and wail at the sight of the smoke rising from the fire that consumes her. In fear of her torment, they will stand at a distance and cry out, Woe, woe to the great city, the mighty city of Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come, and the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because there is no one left to buy their cargo. So as we talked about before, well, let me go ahead and finish this real quick. The cargo is listed off as gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet, of all kinds of citron wood and every article of ivory, precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, and of cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour, and wheat, of cattle, sheep, horses, and chariots, and of slaves and souls of men. So Mother Babylon, ruling over the nations, the nations adopt the practices of Babylon, just like Yahweh rules over Israel, and we're supposed to adopt the practices of Yahweh, which will be the same behavior that we participate in, that we observe in the New Jerusalem, where Yeshua rules as king, and the Father is there as well. Like it's, it this is this is the idea of you mimic, you mimic your God. That's the idea. That's whom you disciple after. So the world, not only by the construction, purposing, planning of the cities are mimicking their God and his destructive and deceptive plannings of why he wants people to be concentrated in cities, but also the actual cargo, the things that make the cities wealthy. Is It's always been about oppression and injustice and unrighteousness. The skewing of the books, unrighteous loans, 
stealing of property. That's the ways of Babylon. So remember we talked earlier about the idea of why the father told them in Genesis 1 and Genesis 9, go and fill the earth. Well, remember, we, this is something we cover in our Investigating Babylon series um, from Antiquities of the Jews, chapter 4. This is uh, Josephus trying to give a history of the world as he knew it. He says, now the sons of Noah were three, Shem, Japheth, and Ham, born 100 years before the deluge. These first of all descended from the mountains into the plains and fixed their habitation there and persuaded others who were greatly afraid of the lower grounds on account of the flood and so were very loath to come down from the higher places to venture to follow their examples. Now, the plain in which they first dwelt was called Shinar. God also commanded them to send colonies abroad for the, th for the thorough pop peopling of the earth that they might not raise seditions amongst themselves but might cultivate a great part of the earth and enjoy its fruits after a plentiful manner. Look at that wording right there, guys, that they may not raise seditions amongst themselves. Seditions is where you steal your brother's land through unrighteousness and many times through murder. This is what the Canaanites did when they stole the land that is referred to as the land of Canaan in the Old Testament. They stole that from Shem. And this is talked about in the book of Jubilees, chapter 8 and 9. They were given a portion of land literally in near Namibia, which is the eastern Atlantic coast of Africa, the southeastern. But they did not, they were not happy with that. And they wanted to be, live in this portion of land along the, the western, or I should say, the uh, Namibia is in the western Atlantic, uh, southwestern Atlantic coast uh, land of Africa. And then they were not happy with that. So Canaan and his descendants went up into the Levant into what we would refer to as modern day Israel. And they stole from Shem the area from Tyre down to Egypt along the Mediterranean Eastern coast where they had the major trade port city of Joppa. They stole that land from Shem by sedition. And this is exactly what God was trying to tell them. I don't want you doing. I want you to spread out on the earth, go colonize the earth so that you're not too close together and partake in sedition of each other's land. It says, but they were so ill-instructed that they did not obey God, for which reason they fell into calamities and were made sensible by experience of what sin they had been guilty. For when they flourished with the numerous youth, God admonished them again to send out colonies. So this is the second time he's telling them, no, go get out of here, guys, spread out, go spread out on the earth. It's completely barren. No more giants, no more Nephilim. You're, you're good. Spread out. It says, but they, imagining the prosperity they enjoyed, was not derived from the favor of God, but supposing that their own power was the proper cause of the plentiful condition they were in, they did not obey him. Nay, they added to their disobedience to the divine will the suspicion that they were therefore ordered to send out separate colonies, that being divided asunder, they might more easily be oppressed. If this is not if this is not the most blatant in your face description of communist ideals in the modern day where people are brainwashed to collect themselves in cities and then once they're there they think they have power in numbers so through their jobs and their trade unions and different things they unionize this is what's been encouraged in the United States in the past 70 years they unionize for power so they can have effect and sway and not be oppressed by somebody. So what, what causes a problem? Unrighteous wages, violation of land, improper taxation, people oppressing their neighbor through, you know, asking too much of them at work and not paying them enough, withholding their wages from them. Versus then it causes the other people to be suspicious that they're being oppressed and they try to figure out how to react and without being so ill-instructed, as it says, they don't have the knowledge of God. So therefore, they go against that corrupt employer who's not acting also in the knowledge of God. And they think they have to refrain from the impression by unionizing, which causes all sorts of problems. This is communism. And it's created because people are not doing the law of God. It is the fleshly reaction of paranoia and fear and mob rule mentality when people are not exhibiting the
the wisdom of God. So let's look at uh, something really, really interesting as we slightly transition to the end of the presentation. Because what have we been setting up this whole time? The idea that the world has been not acting according to the wisdom of God as it governs its people. Therefore, its people cry out with oppression. They're being stolen from. They're being tricked with predatory loans. They're, having, they're being tricked into modern-day prison cities. And they're not being taught proper knowledge how to sustain themselves. Because everything about the society that makes them depend on the government is built on fear. Fear of death is the ultimate fear, but it usually is propagated by multiple layers of other fears that are brainwashed into them, being socioeconomic fear that you're going to be outcasted or not, or not accepted. Also that unemployment fears, health fears, all types of fears. All of it is built upon the idea that you are afraid to die. The, the enemy plays upon this. Hebrews 2 talks about the whole world is in the slavery of the fear of death. This is why we have our wonderful hope of the resurrection. So we don't have to fear the first death. We know our creator promises if we practice his behavior, his son whom we believe in as our Messiah will utilize the authority given to his priesthood and will raise us to the dead from the dead to eternal life on the day of the Lord. That's the promise of the creator to mankind. But mankind who rejects the creator comes up with all different types of ideas on how they want to avoid the fear of death. Just like we read about the billionaire in the United States who wants to create that city of Tolosa where he says, everyone will always feel safe. So let's look at this. Unbelievable, uh, <laughs> unbelievable thing we're about to watch here. Give me one second here. Death didn't have to be the end. Instead, what if you were guaranteed an afterlife? And what if one day you were brought back to life for this reason? Or what if this is happening to you right now? These are not questions of science fiction. This is the humanity's ultimate goal. Megastructures capable of harvesting the power of the sun could be humanity's ticket into deep space exploration. They can also be home to advanced civilizations of aliens that we believe are out there. We just can't seem to find them. With the ability to create complex simulations and replicate consciousness, these megastructures can also be a tool for reincarnation and recent findings may have detected one in our very own galaxy. Since the dawn of rational thought, humans have wondered if there is life after death. But now, with the extreme advancement of technology, the question is becoming, can we create a life after death? The answer may seem like science fiction, but theoretical physicists believe that such a hypothetical is not only possible, but may be probable in a species' ultimate quest for immortality. And how can this be possible, you might ask? Surprisingly, accomplishing this may be easy. Not easy like eating some pizza rolls and calling it a meal, but easy in the sense that scientists have already figured out how to make this possible and can start the process as soon as today. The difficulty is that all we need is a shit ton of energy and a Dyson Sphere. What exactly is a Dyson Sphere? Well, it's the greatest and most powerful uninvented invention in human history. In other words, it's currently a hypothetical megastructure. At the root of the hypothetical is energy, or how we can obtain a substantial amount of energy to do substantial things, to colonize space and bring everyone who ever lived back to life. We need something more powerful than anything on the planet. We need the sun. That's where the Dyson Sphere comes into play. Theoretical physicist Freeman Dyson first proposed the Dyson Sphere in 1960, speculating how an advanced civilization could prosper utilizing all the energy of the sun. We want to harness all of the energy from the floating fireball ancient civilizations used to worship like a god. And theoretically, we can do it. Freeman suggested building a habitable artificial sphere the size of a planetary orbit to accomplish this task. The sphere would consist of a shell of solar collectors around the star, 
so that all of the energy would hit the reflecting surface to be used, creating a massive living space and an enormous energy bank. 400 septillion watts of energy per second, to be exact, which is the equivalent of a trillion times our current worldwide energy usage. Researchers like Stuart Armstrong of Oxford University point out that an actual sphere around the sun is completely impractical. However, in the years since Dyson's proposal, the idea has been modified to a more practical Dyson Swarm, while keeping the premise and goal intact. The Dyson Swarm would consist of thousands of relatively small mirrors or solar panels that would orbit the sun like a dense cloud of bees buzzing around a hive. The copious amounts of panels would shroud the sun from an external view and capture most of the available solar energy. Armstrong, once a skeptic of Dyson's plan, believes that the swarm method is not only practical, but could be manufactured by robots mining materials in as little as several decades. The Dyson sphere wasn't originally thought up as a source of a reincarnation machine. It was first a possible solution to the Fermi paradox. You know, everyone's favorite theoretical paradox by we're not currently hanging out with aliens, even though the universe is so big that we probably should be by now. Dyson and many other scientists theorize that we don't see them because they're all chilling in their own Dyson spheres. The theory is that when an intelligent alien species settles moons and planets in their local stellar neighborhood, and their population increases and consumes more energy, any species would need to turn to their sun and create their version of a Dyson sphere. This has led some researchers to believe that the way to find an advanced alien species is to try to find their Dyson sphere. In 2015, there was speculation that one had been discovered after Yale astronomer Tabitha Boyajian reported a mysterious dimming of light from a star called KIC 8462852, whose irregular flickering looked like nothing researchers had ever seen before. The organization known as SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, conducted a study showing that building a Dyson sphere around a black hole would be effective. The results of the study led the team to report that a megastructure around the stellar mass black hole is detectable in the ultraviolet, optical, near-infrared, and mid-infrared wavelengths via the waste heat radiation in the Milky Way galaxy. While the hunt for our alien neighbors remains a mystery, researchers direct their time to how humans could one day use the Dyson Sphere and the almost endless amount of energy it will provide. Transhumanist Alexei Turkin has led the charge in how a Dyson Sphere would be able to bring the dead back to life and create a virtual afterlife for all to enjoy. Turkin and fellow researcher Maxim Chernyakov developed the Immortality Roadmap, theorizing different ways humans can transcend death. Plan C in the Roadmap details how a Dyson Sphere can be used in this way by drawing from its massive reserve of energy to collect enough personal and historical data of a person's life to build a digital copy. Advanced AI would use DNA and other information to personalize the copies, which can be extracted via global archaeology. After a copy is created, Turkin suggests that it would then be run through an advanced simulation, reliving the person's entire life. Once the simulated life is finished, the copy would then be transformed to a digital afterlife, where they could spend their days with copied consciousnesses of their friends, families, and all those in between. There are many needed steps to get to the point of turning ourselves into Sims, but the paradigm shift that a Dyson Sphere would create would make those steps achievable. When or if we'll get there, it's still up in the air. We've got to make sure we don't destroy ourselves as a species first. However, as we watch technology advance to unimaginable levels before our very eyes, we need to consider what is truly unimaginable and what just hasn't happened yet. We understand that having that thought process takes an open mind, even faith in the future in many ways. So the easiest thing we can do is break these ideas down and hold on to hope and commitment to making the future a better place. In regards to the Dyson Sphere, biochemist George Dvorsky is doing just that in his paper how to build a Dyson Sphere in five relatively easy steps. His strategy. Listen closely to the five steps. Echoed similarly by Turkin, 
relies on autonomous nanorobots. Once we get to the point as a civilization where we can excel in using nanotechnology, once we get into space, Dvorsky claims that all we have to do is get energy, mine mercury, get materials into orbit, make solar collectors, extract energy. Get energy, mine mercury. You guys remember um, investigating Babylon part four. I talked about also in part 12, when we talked about NASA, we talked about the Vimanas and what actually powered them. It was the Quicksilver, also called Mercury. So not only, I don't know if you saw the shift in this, there's a few more seconds here, we'll finish it up, but I don't know if you saw the shift in what they were theoretically proposing, right? Which is something ludicrous. Obviously there's no space. We're going to close this, uh, the, you know, the creator helps us verifiably observe that we're in an enclosed environment with the pressurized atmosphere. So there is no going to the sun and building anything around it to harvest its energy. Obviously that is out of the box and ludicrous, but then they mold the idea slower and slower down into, oh, well then aliens would surely have their own Dyson sphere if they ever showed up. And then, oh, we could build something like that. And then surely if the aliens had that Dyson sphere, that they all aliens that would show up here surely would show up in a Dyson sphere, a sphere, which would have enough power to probably resurrect us. So do you guys see how that see how that works? Remember who the dragon is? Gives his authority to the first beast, then to the second beast, and the second beast causes the first beast who had a mortal head wound to live, and the world was wondering after him. False line signs and wonders. They're prepping the world to receive the traveler to show up in the Dyson sphere. And then, humanity is set for its next chapter in the cosmos. Even though technology won't advance enough for us to see these steps come to fruition, it's up to us to get the project started and make sure we don't kill ourselves along the way. They're prepping you, folks. They're prepping you for the reveal of the return of Zeus, the dragon, Ra. And he will be in a big sphere. And... They're prepping the world to build for jet for for possibly a generation, possibly many decades to get the world used to that, to traversing back and forth quickly to high altitudes where there's livable portions of land that are now being floated. We talked about that in part 20 of our Investigating Babylon series that normalizes the interaction with the return of the our progenitor who's worshipped and revered like a god because of his power and his advanced knowledge. But can we really resurrect ourselves if we just had enough power? What does scripture tell us? Psalm 49, 7 through 9. No man can possibly redeem his brother or pay his ransom to God. For the redemption of his soul is costly and never can payment suffice that he should live on forever and not see decay. But a man, despite his wealth, cannot endure. He is like the beasts that perish. This is the fate of the self-confident and their followers who endorse their sayings, Selah. Like sheep, they're destined for Sheol. Death will be their shepherd. The upright will rule them in the morning and their form will decay in Sheol, far from their lofty abode. God will redeem my life from Sheol, for he will surely take me to himself. Isn't that beautiful? So let's look at what they're proposing to get people ready for the sky dwellings. Bezos dreams that one day a trillion people will live and work in space. But of course, that day is a long way off. To get there, Bezos has unveiled a series of steps which will lay the foundations for future generations to come and ultimately lead to giant space colonies, like this one. Bezos calls them O'Neill colonies, after American physicist Gerard Kitchen O'Neill, who first developed the idea. These are very large structures, miles on end, and they hold a million people or more each. 
And this structure rotates to induce artificial gravity. And just how big is it? For scale, here's the International Space Station. And these enormous artificial worlds don't just have to be for humans. Some could be national parks. But whatever they're for, Bezos is sure of one thing. These are really pleasant places to live. Some of these O'Neill colonies might choose to replicate Earth cities. They might pick historical cities and mimic them in some way. There'd be whole new kinds of architecture. These are ideal climates. These are shirt sleeve environments. This is Maui on its best day all year long. No rain, no storms, no earthquakes. What does the architecture even look like when it no longer has its primary purpose of shelter? Admittedly, doesn't that sound pretty great? Sure. But how practical is it to have entire companies dedicated to advancing human civilization in space? And even according to Bezos. Those entrepreneurial companies cannot exist today. It's impossible. And the reason is the price of admission to do interesting things in space right now is just too high because there's no infrastructure. And that's where his space company Blue Origin comes in. First, it's working on launching and building reusable rockets like New Shepard and New Glenn, which are projected to drastically cut the cost of launching payloads into space. And secondly, Bezos wants to start pulling resources from the moon. One of the most important things we know about the moon today is that there's water there. It's in the form of ice. It's in the permanently shadowed craters on the poles of the moon. And water is an incredibly valuable resource. You can use electrolysis to break down water into hydrogen and oxygen, and you have propellants. Okay, so how do you extract lunar water? You go to the moon and you mine it. Ideally with this, blue moon. We've been working on this lander for three years. It's a very large lander. It'll soft land in precise way, 3.6 metric tons onto the lunar surface. Space companies like Blue Origin, SpaceX, Boeing, and NASA are all pioneering the next generation of space exploration, whether it's humans on the moon by 2024 or colonies on Mars by the 2030s. One thing is certain, the 21st century space race is here. Stop the cap. <laughs> Yeah, all lies, guys. In, in fact, you just watched a two and a half minute, um, two and a half minute presentation for investor fraud. It's amazing what th what these guys can claim and get away with, and then ask for money and take investors and just fleece people of this crazy money. In fact, um, Jaronism does a great a great job uh, in the past where he would go on to like Indiegogo and Fiverr and look at all the quote unquote homemade rocket space programs small company space programs that uh, that wanted to launch their own rocket. These people are just getting millions of dollars uh, in investment for their fundraiser and then never any update on the on the program. Never obviously don't go to space, never any update on the rocket. And then, you know, but yet Fiverr and Indiegogo and those types, of they're not taking those fundraisers down. They're letting more come up. You know, they're just fleecing the people fleecing. Yeah, it's crazy. So but like I said before, here's what here's what they're going to be doing as they prep the world, as we're seeing with modern media, science, movies, TVs, they're prepping the world to welcome back Zeus and Ra, whom they're going to say is the panspermia, the alien who seeded life on the earth and left. And they want the world to be accepting of that because they must have the space narrative for this to work. And they don't want you to think that we've already always had this technology. So like we talked about the Vamanas in the Investigating Babylon series, we're going to go into the counter narrative they want to put out so that you don't think that that's something that's already been here in the past. This is why they don't teach you about Vamanas in school, not even in college. So let's take a quick look at how they are hiding Vamanas or they're going to try to hide the, the Vamanas by claiming it's just been done before by American inventors. This is his drawings, blueprints. Okay, how do you find all this? Look at this, man. This is all these letters. Dig in, man. (laughs) 
During his hunt into Weiger's life, Randy discovered something extraordinary. Hand-drawn designs for an exotic aircraft dating back to the 1920s. Alex appeared to have invented the very first flying saucer. That was an amazing find in itself. When I saw the blueprints, it was undeniable that he was the creator. Weigers called his futuristic flying machine the Discopter. Designed to take off vertically and float on a cushion of air, it was a unique concept, and one he thought cities of the future would make full use of. Weigers patented the Discopter in 1944 and then tried to sell it. He starts sending all of these letters to all kinds of companies telling them about his invention. As word of the Discopter began to spread, Alex felt the U.S. military stole the idea. It was an accusation they denied. But for Weigers, evidence of the theft was there for all to see as images of his flying saucer seeped into popular culture, influencing everything from architecture to cars and movies. A two-seater, ready soon, may be the car or chopper of the future. There's this whole flurry of stories. Weiger's first with saucer. Dutchman says he designed flying saucer 23 years ago, the man who invented the flying disc. He didn't really seem to be after compensation as much as recognition that he'd done something important and wanted a bit of credit for it. Spoiler alert, the Discopter never became a reality. But the flying saucers it inspired live on in Randy's collection of UFO memorabilia. All right. Like I said, they're they're trying to say this dude invented flying saucers, the Vamana shaped flying saucers, and this government stole it from them in the 60s, but that he invented them back in the 20s. No. <laughs> Again, uh, this is why we cover the Nazi Bell Project in part 12 of our Investigate Babylon series, as well as the history of Vamanas from ancient India and ancient Babylon and ancient Egypt in part four of our Investigate Babylon series. This is where we have literal saucer shaped Vamanas from texts that are 4,000 years old, verified by the, the, the National Museum of, of History in India, like, or, you know, their, their own history. This is a part of their Vedic texts that the gods flew around in crafts and that they had knew the power of them and how to maneuver them and had different capabilities. And there were different shapes to them. Some were big enough to hold hundreds and hundreds of people. And some were only single occupants. And this is what the interconnected rulers of, of India and Mesopotamia, which is Babylon and Greece and Egypt, all had them. Very well known. So if we're going to get the populace, if, if they, the powers that be want to get the entire populace to be accepting of Zeus and Ra when he comes back, they have to slowly put this stuff into the mind of the people through the mass programming, the propaganda. They have to disseminate the information to get you visually aware of it so that if you see the real thing, you're not truly surprised and you're not afraid because you have to be accepting of him. They don't want you shooting an RPG at him, right? So they have to make this seem normalized and good for you. And they're already starting to release images, news reports, not just of the Vamanas and that there's definitely aliens among us. That was a big thing last year but even of Mother Babylon. And let's take a quick look at it. From Spokane, Washington, from the International Space Station on September the 12th of 2022, when the space station was above Egypt. Here goes the object right here coming up from the bottom. The space station is moving from left to right. This object was moving from south to north across the field of view 
totally on its own. It wasn't part of the space station. That was some sort of a random object. That's a light up there on the surface of the Earth. This is something in the atmosphere above planet Earth. And this next segment was noticed by two different people on the same day. Heidi took this still image of something here above the horizon as the, the space station was on the daylight side of the Earth. She noticed this here off in the distance. James also noticed the same thing on the same day. This was September the 9th of 2022. James sent in this video and you're going to see that same light over here kind of wrap around what looks like a circle over here or a sphere. This is the original speed. You're going to see the light being manipulated by something over here in the distance. You're going to see the light on both sides here over here on the left and over here on the right go up and meet each other up here on the top like it's wrapping around an invisible round object over there maybe something that's that's shaped like a sphere this is the original speed when i put it in fast forward you'll be able to see it more clear here we go ultra fast forward you're gonna see the light go up and wrap around something right there see it it's almost like it's being influenced by something round over there in the distance that's not necessarily visible by this camera, but you can see the light wrapping around it. Some sort of mysterious activity. That's probably the best way to describe this. Way off in the distance. Don't know how else to describe it other than mysterious light picked up by the International Space Station. Just happened to be noticed by two different people down here on Earth from two different locations that were watching the live feed at the same time <laughs> like i said they have to start releasing these things to get people into um into accepting the idea right like we said the, the whole theory with panspermia leads to the theoretical physicists and the transhumanists saying if aliens did come back they must be they would they would obviously be in a dyson sphere and now I don't believe the ISS is truly up there above the earth. And I don't think that the heliocentric narrative is truly real. I believe in the biblical narrative of cosmology, but again, just like they produce and release footage from the ISS, they release this one to the public to show people they're getting it into the, the consciousness. Like, Oh my goodness. If there is some sort of alien up there, like it's a sphere. Yeah. It's interesting. Interesting. But what does the scriptures say? The devil led Yeshua up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. I will give you authority over all these kingdoms and all their glory, he said, for it has been relinquished to me and I can give it to anyone I wish. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. So we've already talked and discussed in the Investigate Babylon series exactly what this high place was that Satan would have taken him to be able to see all the kingdoms in the world at one time. It would be Mother Babylon. It would be what the ancients called Mount Maru or Mount Olympus. This piece of land high in the air, specifically one enclosed with a double-gated dome, like the Greek philosophers described, and it's a sphere. But it's a piece of land in a massive sphere. This is what the ancients would have considered, the ancient Indians would have considered a pushpaka, which is an ancient large mamana that capable of holding an entire city. This is why, in my opinion, in this passage, the angels have to show up after this third temptation for Yeshua to help him, to minister to him, because he, he needs to get down, basically. But Satan claims he, was, he has authority over all these kingdoms they're looking at beneath them. Because he actually does. This is what we're setting up, this whole concept. If they're going to worship the dragon who gives authority to the first beast in Revelation 13, the kings of the earth have to know who the dragon is, and I promise you they're already worshiping him. They already know, at least the ones in the know, know where he is, and he's been here this whole time. The narrative of the alien showing back up, who used to be here in the past and now has come back, that's just a lie to get people to still fall into the heliocentric narrative and look for an alien savior for their problems. But the kings of the earth give their authority to the dragon. They take marching orders from him. That's why they all do the same corrupt practices and oppress their people. They're fleecing the people. The head of the breakaway civilization is Mother Babylon. It's all the top of the pyramid. Revelation 13, 4 through 5. 
they worship the dragon who had given authority to the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who's like the beast who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to speak arrogant and blasphemous words and the authority to act for 42 months. 42 months, guys. That's why the series is named 42. He's got the authority to act for 42 months because that is, that's all he's got. And that has been, that is at the end of 42 months, the Messiah is going to arrive. But we're going to continue this series. Next one is about the fall of Babylon, because that's what initiates the 42 month time period where there's already been several, in my opinion, several decades the world has already accepted the dragon again and is interacting with him on a large scale. Mass oppression is happening. Wars are happening. People are not, not everyone's going for it. But this is why we then once, once certain things happen that we'll go into next week, we start and kick off the 42. So this is why I want to encourage everyone listening. I know a lot of churches want to talk about Revelation as it's, it's doom and gloom for believers and it's scary. And yes, there will be persecution for believers, but their time is short. It's not going to be forever. And as believers, even if we get caught up in that persecution, we do not fear the first death. We are promised the hope of the resurrection. And our Messiah comes back and stops all the, all the nonsense, all the bloodshed, the corruption, the oppression, the illegalities that are perpetrated on mankind across the earth. He's going to stop it all. And, and the earth will be ruled with righteousness. Unfortunately, the earth goes through some birth pangs before then. There's wars, famine, rumors of wars. There's problems. So this is what the 42 is delving into in a greater, all the eschatology of scripture. We'll delve into it a little bit greater in detail. Now that we've laid the long foundation of the investigating Babylon series, this is why I said the 42 series was going to be a little bit more advanced. Um, the Investigating Babylon series was just a huge framework, if you will, to understand all the all the, the nuances, all the details that it break down in, in eschatology. So Lord willing, by the end of the 42 series, with its 21 parts, you'll have 42 total parts to encourage you to understand inside and out how to relate this to other people and to be encouraged to know you can see you can see the, the you know the, the trickery of communist policies and realize oh that goes against the word of god here you can see the trickery of the space heliocentric narrative and realize oh that goes against the word of god here everything we're being shown is a lie i can stand on the word of truth with utter confidence and know how to communicate it and share it to my neighbors that is what spreads Knowledge of the truth and the hope. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I don't think I'm going to be doing questions. My voice is going out. So you guys are amazing. Thank you for the super chat, brother. Appreciate that a lot. Um, if you guys like what we're doing and you want to support us, Patreon is always a great way. Um, we are still working on the... Uh, that's not. That's weird. That's not coming up. Um, we are still working on the contextual study guide. Um, if you guys are um, interested, just part of the $20, it's the family tier, the $20 a month, and you get access to the books we've already completed, plus the ones we're about to release soon that I'm still working on. Um, and then, of course, our overall goal is to have 100, 100 plus books of scripture that we've gone through and, and put in the contextual study guide format. And then um, that's the PDF that you have access to, to to download. You can, I don't even, there's no requirement. You can share with as many people as you want. Um, I give it out to free to people sometimes too already, like, you know, the book of Romans, the book of James and other things that I've given to people. Um, obviously we've, you know, we've got the Teespring, we've got the, the book of first Enoch, uh, on Amazon. Most of, much of that is in the video description, as well as we're trying to move away from PayPal. We have the cash app link below there. If you, if that's a way that you want to support us. Um, but you guys are a huge blessing. You guys help me allow me to have the time to put together this stuff and research this information and make sure that all of it makes sense. And that's in a, and it's in a form that you can share with other people. So 
I mean, you guys are the real MVPs. You, you give me the opportunity to do this. Thank you so much for your support and for the kind words as we go through this, this type of information, because I know it can seem outlandish at first, but everyone that's here is at least giving me the benefit of the doubt to hear me out. And that's a, that, that says a lot. So big thank you. Thank you guys so much. We appreciate you and we'll see you next time.